is she? You mean quiet? In her cell, of course. Why did you send her out with the boss on that mission? She proved herself well enough, didn't she? The boss sure knows talent when he sees it. That woman will never be one of us. She's targeting him. Don't forget, we do owe her one. What's that supposed to mean? Remember what happened when she first got here? She shot down the aircraft Cypher sent after us. Not only that, she hit the cockpit. Who else could have done that? We're talking about a fighter jet traveling at Mach speed. What's your point? If she hadn't been there, the boss's chopper would be at the bottom of the ocean right now. Or, it would have been followed right back to Mother Base. So let's say she does have some elaborate scheme in the works. If you want to catch her in the act, all we can do is sit back and wait. On the other hand, if she swears allegiance to the boss like our other Fulton recruits, he couldn't ask for a better partner. Oh, she's got you fooled. I have eyes on her. If she tries anything, she'll regret it. We lose nothing either way. It wasn't just Cypher. Back in the Caribbean, every eye in the world was turned on us. A private army. Just a bunch of guys with guns in possession of a nuke? Why wouldn't they be uncomfortable? And that's why you made sure the inspection happened. Well, I thought our best move was to prove to the UN through the IAEA that we had no nuke. Of course, I was against us having it in the first place, but that was Snake's decision. The boss wasn't responsible. Well, don't get me wrong, I, I still believed in Snake. I thought I was making the best decision for all of us, that's all. I figured we should get a third party to exonerate us before proof of the nuke did get out. And who better to do that than an organization with international authority? <sighs> so the truth is, you took it upon yourself to agree to an inspection arranged by the UN. Only the inspection was a ruse, and Cypher Strike Force XOF showed up instead. I had no idea that would happen. Enough bullshit! Oh, sure, like I could have known. You know, I was just trying to prove our innocence to the world. What's wrong with that? We're not interested in the excuses you thought up. The truth is objective. Just see it from my point of view. You led XOF to the control tower. They seized it, giving them complete control over the base. Moments later, they detonated C4 on the strut legs. Anyone who'd managed to survive was hunted down by the assault force and their choppers. You can't believe I did that on purpose! That was the end of Mother Base. But it wasn't the end for you. How can you... Look, think about it. I lost something too. I built Zeke and it got buried underwater. I am a victim! That raises the big questions. Why were you the only one spared? You got away without a scratch. Why did Strangelove leave the base on the eve of the inspection? You two were close. Strangelove? <laughs> and how did you manage to build something that surpasses Zeke in every way? Because you did everything they told you. <laughs> You're the only one who didn't lose a thing. That is the truth. I was taken away against my will. Skullface forced me to do his research these past nine years. He used me. I lost nine years! Nine years? We all lost nine years. It wasn't just you. I suppose blaming me makes you feel better, does it? But who's gonna give me back all the time I lost? You're not getting anything back. <sighs> You're not a victim here, Emmerich. You're the perpetrator. I didn't know anything. Nobody can back that up. Yeah, all the evidence is at the bottom of the ocean. You know the hardest man to break. The type who's fooling himself. That takes time. It's easier to live a convenient lie than a painful truth. Is that the piece you've chosen, Doc? I'm not lying. Of course. Just let me check one or two things. On that day, you were in the control tower with him. Lucky you. That's how you got out unscathed. And you escaped on one of their choppers. Only you, right before the base went under. They had me blindfolded the whole time. I've never been so scared. The whole flight, I thought they'd kill me. B 
but, but thinking of you kept me going. My comrades, all the way. And? There was a plane journey, and then we traveled by road. When they finally took off the blindfold, I was in kind of a warehouse, on the floor. Afghanistan, it was that research lab. I couldn't believe they'd taken me halfway around the world. And soon enough, he came. Skullface. He's the one who's really behind that mother base attack. He forced me into that research. What kind of research? He told me to build a bipedal walking tank for the Soviet Union. Like Peace Walker. A system that could fire an ICBM-class nuclear weapon. That's how the Sahelanthropus project got started. Sahelanthropus. Those AI weapons I'd made in Costa Rica were like toys by comparison. A whole world apart from reptilian four-legged crawling and, and that ridiculous hunched-over bipedal waddling. My design evolved to the dawn of mankind. Sahelanthropus, the first steps towards humanity. An upright bipedal weapon system. Originally, Sahelanthropus was going to be a manned weapons platform. I designed a cockpit in its head and I planned to fill it with water as a buffering agent. Like how Pass modified Zeke for human control. Don't compare me to some amateur. I designed it for human control from the beginning. The problem was miniaturizing the posture control AI. You remember the reptile pod? The AI that controlled your unmanned weapons. Attaching it externally makes it vulnerable, so this time I wanted it beneath the armor. Meaning I had to make the AI smaller. I got it down to less than a tenth the size without any loss in computation speed. But it was still too big for the cockpit. There wasn't enough room for the pilot. If I made the head bigger, its body would have to be bigger to support it. Too big to be practical. In the end, human piloting was taken off the table. I tested a remote control system too, but there was the time lag and I wasn't satisfied with its precision either. Plus, it would be useless if the enemy jammed it. So next, I went back to trying an AI-only system. To do that, I had the AI pods recovered from Nicaragua. <sighs> this was a hybrid AI, a combination of Peace Walker's reptile and mammal pods. The only AIs that had ever successfully operated an unmanned nuclear weapon system. Really? You'd need some help to get that working. Expert help. Did you work with someone? I worked alone. You did that yourself? <laughs> That's the thing. The AI didn't pan out in the end either. But I did finally get Sahelanthropus walking by folding over its upper body to lower its center of gravity. The first upright bipedal locomotive weapon system in the history of mankind. I guess technically it falls into the anthropoid ape category. I don't see the benefit of having it stand taller. On terrain with significant differences in elevation like Afghanistan, you need a body that's vertically adaptable. That also lets it attack from long range while using mountain ridges for cover. So, making it walk upright was the most important factor in giving it superior height capability. As the name suggests, that was the whole point of Sahelanthropus. But I was being pushed for results. Having the AI mounted externally would have been the fastest way to get it working. I just needed more data so it could maintain its balance. But Skullface refused to wait. He dismissed the idea of AI control and took Sahelanthropus away from me before I could finish it. But it was walking when it came after you. That's just it. I don't understand how Skullface got it to move upright. Without a pilot or an AI. And walking at that speed, too. It's beyond anything I could have imagined. This is like the Wright brothers making it to the moon. I I'm just as clueless as you are. So this Soholanthropus, where is it now? I have no idea. All my experiments took place at that cave. I've never seen it anywhere else. Besides, it's still just an incomplete prototype at this point, and nothing but a paper tiger. Even if it can walk, it's far from being a viable weapons platform. It wouldn't be useful in actual battle. 
Emmerich will remain here at Mother Base for now, but not as a member of Diamond Dogs. I still don't trust him. That work for you? Fine by me. He can't be allowed any contact with staff either. Yeah. A lot of the guys would love some payback for nine years ago. We still need him alive. But we have to restrict his movements. He can only go where we tell him. And of course, the interrogations will continue. He worked for that skull bastard for nearly a decade. He still has more to tell us. How long are we gonna press him? If our investigation shows he really had nothing to do with the attack, we'll reconsider his place here. But I don't expect that to happen. Remember that water tank-shaped object in Emmerich's lab in the Soviet base camp? The thing that started talking to you like a possessed answering machine. That was a pod belt for housing the AI used to control unmanned weapons. You remember, back in 74 in Costa Rica. It was in those machines you fought there. They were designated Pupa, Chrysalis, Cocoon, and Basilisk. And each of them was fitted with an AI unit called a Reptile Pod. Emmerich created it. It mainly handled the machine's posture control and autonomous behavior. But the Basilisk, aka Peace Walker, also featured a second AI pod. That one was called the Mammal Pod, and it was created by Dr. Strangelove. She tried to recreate the boss's personality through the Mammal Pod, but you pulled out its memory boards. That's when it transferred its own functions to its Reptile Pod. Just like a human brain compensating for damage by using the remaining healthy parts. The result was a unique entity. A hybrid of the reptile and the mammal. It sank to the bottom of Lake Nicaragua with Peace Walker. But apparently they salvaged it and transported it to that lab. Don't let it deceive you, Snake. It may sound like the boss, but it has neither a personality nor a will. Like Emmerich says, it's just a machine. You call that thing Sahalanthropus. Where does the name come from? Well, several years ago, an excavation team discovered a hominid skull in the Sahel region. Central Africa. The Southern Sahara. Cypher gave the specimen the name Sahalanthropus. Man of Sahel. And then they covered the whole thing up. Why? They probably wanted to monopolize information about human evolution to have a head start in their genetic research. At least, until they had an idea of what they'd found. It was that big of a discovery, huh? Sahalanthropus was a gracile hominid, estimated to have lived about seven million years ago. What's significant about it is how its skull's foramen magnum faces down. In other words, its spinal column supported its head from underneath. It stood upright. Right. Which would mean Sahelanthropus walked upright three million years before Australopithecus, making it the world's oldest human species. Walking upright. I get it. Hence the name Sahelanthropus for your machine. Walking upright was the decisive difference between our ancestors and other anthropoids. Our brains could get heavier once they were supported by the spinal column. That led to the use of tools and the development of complex communication through language. Only man is capable of this. My creation will be the progenitor of all bipedal weapon platforms. And you did this for Cypher? No, n not at all. Sahelanthropus is the best proof that I never betrayed you guys. What do you mean? The reconstructed Sahelanthropus skull looked exactly like the skull we used as our logo nine years ago in the Caribbean. An army without a nation. Outside the world order. The design was based on Pangaea, the supercontinent that existed 250 million years ago, right? Yeah. When the world was a single landmass, that concept's at the source of our strength. I felt the same way about Sahelanthropus. Sure, I was forced to build it under their orders, but I always wanted to put its technology back in our hands someday. That's the reason I incorporated the old insignia into Sahelanthropus's name. Don't you see? That's how much I was thinking about you guys. Oh, I see, all right. I see someone desperate to cover his ass. You can say whatever you want after the fact, but that skull also symbolizes somebody else. Skull face. 
Snake, you finally came. It just... don't record this, okay? I'm not recording anything. What's this about? What I'm about to say stays between you and me. It's about the weapon to surpass Metal Gear. <sighs> Do you know a researcher by the name of Clark? He works in the biotech industry. Real advanced stuff. His area is bioengineering, but lately, he's also gotten into genetic research. Never heard of him. Well then, what do you know about cloning? <sighs> I think I've heard enough. Hold on, this is important. Cloning lets you create a genetic copy of an organism. You take the nucleus of one of its cells, and you swap it with the nucleus of an unfertilized egg from another member of the same species. They started out working with plants, but since then they've had success with other organisms, including mammals. It's a hot area for a lot of places right now. Corporations, universities, research groups. There's no shortage of scientists out to get famous and patent their work, with morality taking a back seat. Isn't that a little outside your field? Well, it's got nothing to do with my research. But I thought it might be of interest to you. Cloning. And Dr. Clark, I mean. Go on. Now, this is really highly classified stuff. But I've heard that an American biotech company has successfully cloned a human being. What's more, it happened over ten years ago. And the researcher behind it was Dr. Clark. You've really never heard of him? I don't meet many doctors. This Dr. Clark is a complete ghost, even to others in his field. His age, where he comes from, that might not be his real name. And I can't even say for sure he's a he. Clark's employer, ATGC, its company motto is embracing your hopes, preserving talent. What does this have to do with me? Cypher. Dr. Clark works for ATGC, and they have connections to DARPA. Cypher couldn't function without the communications network DARPA's built. Meaning, Cypher has to be a part of the Pentagon. Or at least, the two are joined at the hip. DARPA is a driving force behind human cloning. It's a pretty high priority project for them. And this Dr. Clark? Some say he's a pivotal player in Cypher. But that's not all. Every cell nucleus in an organism contains the genetic information for that organism. Think of it as a blueprint for life. Clark appears to be working on how to decode this information and rearrange it at will. If you could do that, it would mean being able to custom design human beings for specific purposes. Can you believe that? Suppose for a moment that this is all fact. A man of your talents, if your genetic information died with you, that would be a terrible loss for mankind. But what if mankind could preserve you for future generations by cloning you? All right, enough. I get the idea. Look, I know it's inductive reasoning, but this weapon to surpass Metal Gear they're developing in Africa, I believe it's something that uses this new technology. <sighs> Speaking as a fellow scientist, it chills me to the bone. That's rich coming from you. If genes serve as our blueprint, then I wonder if they include an impulse that drives us to tweak the design. Can you imagine that? Genes, encoded with information that wants its children to decode it. Is life itself putting the direction of our next evolution in the hands of scientists? I guess it would take some real arrogance to believe that. And yet, it could be what Cypher's after. I think you're barking up the wrong tree. But that was an interesting story. It'd make a good movie. You have to believe me. Where'd you hear all this anyway? Where? I just overheard it in bits and pieces while I was forced to do that research for them. Right. Wait a minute. Look. I want to help you. I want to be of service here. I'm risking my life with this. Is that so? Maybe it's time we brought someone else into the conversation. No, not him. Not Ocelot. You can't do this! Boss, I have the report on that cargo we stole from Cypher's truck. 
The PF was transporting two things. The analysis of that malachite has come back first. Naturally, the main compound is copper. There's also a small amount of cobalt. Nothing unusual so far. Southern Zaire is a well-known copper belt. However, in addition to these, we also detected a trace amount of uranium. The content percentage, though, is too low for nuclear development. It most likely came from Shinkalobwe mine. That's where the uranium in that area comes from. The mine's closed, as all the high-purity uranium ore dried up a long time ago. But you could probably still find it there in small quantities. That said, there are plenty of other uranium mines that are in operation, like in Niger, Namibia, South Africa. Why go to an abandoned mine to scrape up whatever's left and ship it out in mass quantities without refining it? They were transporting that yellow cake too, which would suggest they have the technology to refine uranium. Anyway, that about sums it up. Unfortunately, the analysis of that yellow cake is taking a little longer. I'll let you know when it's done. Boss, sorry to keep you waiting. We finally finished analyzing that yellow cake Cypher was moving. There was nothing unusual about the composition of the yellow cake itself. Most of it was oxidized uranium, with the rest being impurities, various metals as well as traces of organic matter. What's interesting is the composition of these impurities. When we checked them against the impurities found in the copper ore, it was clear the yellow cake didn't come from Shinkalobwe meaning they went to the trouble of mining two sources of uranium, then transported them together in different states. Another thing, we detected a very thin layer of highly enriched uranium in the middle of the yellow cake. Now that is very interesting. It may not be a lot, but it points to the existence of uranium enriching technology. After all, yellow cake can't naturally produce highly enriched uranium. If they could mass produce this, they'd be just one step away from a gun barrel type nuclear bomb. But uranium enrichment requires advanced technology and a large scale facility. If that kind of place existed in Zaire, the Soviet Union wouldn't sit idly by. And there's another question. Where were they transporting the yellow cake and malachite uranium? The first place that comes to mind is South Africa. The government was supposed to have abandoned nuclear weapons development after caving to international pressure. But rumors persist that it's continued in secret. Plus, CRS were escorting the truck, and they're based out of South Africa. And then South Africa does have an abandoned test site. If Cypher's involved with nuclear development in South Africa. But how would that fit with their weapon to surpass Metal Gear? We need more information. Shinkalobwe. There's a name I haven't heard in a while. The U.S. bought a lot of uranium from Shinkalobwe mine during World War II for the Manhattan Project. They even sent a squad from the Army Corps of Engineers to reopen the mine after it was flooded. That's how good its uranium must have been. With that, the world's first nuclear test was a success. Shinkalobwe uranium might have been used in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, too. Just hearing its name is like seeing all the phantoms of the war rise up to haunt us. But all the uranium's dried up, and the mine's been closed for years. So someone reopened it? Right. Zero Risk Security seized control of the area and were forcing locals to work in it. And the Zairean government was getting a slice of what they took in exchange for looking the other way. Mobutu has to finance his taste somehow. He'll gladly sell the rights to some old mine. The question is, why would Zero Risk Security do this kind of thing? Or rather, why were their employers, Cypher, interested in an abandoned mine? Maybe getting trace amounts of uranium, yet to the naked eye it appears to be ordinary malachite. Meaning security would be lax. Not a very efficient way of obtaining it, but easier to move. But how would they enrich it at its destination? Did the yellow cake really have a layer of highly enriched uranium in it? Having trouble believing it? No. If they say it's real, then it's real. In which case, they might have some enrichment method that we don't know about. And this was to test it out? It's possible. And that would mean it's almost complete. Ever since the attack on your unit nine years ago, the name Big Boss has become known the world over. What do you mean? Those of your men who survived traveled far and wide. They fought throughout the world. In fact, they're part of the reason we have all these PFs now. Every one of them suffered their own phantom pain from losing you. Talking about you wherever they went helped to heal their wounds. Your actions and words, your legend, has been told on every battlefield they've set foot on. 
Obviously, as the tales have spread, the truth's been distorted, painted over. Big Boss sacrificed himself to show us the threat that Cypher poses. He sounded a warning, so it goes. A warning? Too much power destroys the hands that hold it. Apparently, you chose to be a living example of that. I never said any of that. The moment any truth is passed on, it starts turning into fiction. The problem is, fiction inspires people more than facts. To the world, you're now the legendary mercenary Big Boss. The lessons you've taught the PFs are the reason they're so widespread. They're the reason they've survived. And you know what they all aspire to? To one day go nuclear, just like you did, and stand up to Cypher. Of all the stupid things you could do, they'll never understand what you really wanted. Heroes are misunderstood. It takes a man of the same caliber to understand what drives them. Bottom line is, these guys want to be like their hero, Big Boss. And deep down, they all have their eyes on nuclear weapons. They say that a nuke is the only means of standing against Cypher. But these days, it's becoming little more than a slogan to rally the troops and survive in a cutthroat business. Currently, there are three major PFs who've expanded into Central Africa. CFA, Rogue Coyote, and Zero Risk Security. HEC's investigations have shown there's almost no overlap between their areas of operation. It's not so much a turf war, more like they have a gentleman's agreement. If you do cross paths with them, you probably won't have to face more than one at a time. Still, don't expect to walk in the park. The CFA, Contract Forces of Africa. These guys are a major player. Their head office is in Pretoria, South Africa. That's also where the South African Defense Force is headquartered. We think the two are closely connected. An HEC investigation revealed that most of the CFA's operators are former SADF soldiers. South Africa has been locked in struggles with neighboring regimes for years. That means constant action. And we know better than anyone that's the best kind of training. A company drawing its recruits from hardened military vets. You can bet they know how to handle themselves. Do not underestimate them. Within the CFA is a company of soldiers made up mainly of locally hired operators. They speak Afrikaans to communicate with personnel from the CFA. But if you notice any speaking the local language, that's them. Though hired from the local population, they were originally part of a paramilitary group, so they'll have plenty of combat experience. And unlike their days shooting junkyard rifles out of beat-up pickup trucks, the CFA now supplies them with the latest gear from the West. On top of that, they've been combat trained by the South African Army. All that adds up to a much stronger fighting force. So don't brush them off. Look at the Angola-Zaire border region. These Bank of the Muneni River in particular. It's a microcosm of a problem that stretches all across Africa. There's a civil war going on in Angola fought between the government MPLA and the Western-backed Unida. Zaire is still a dictatorship under President Mobutu, but numerous uprisings have broken out in its remote regions. With all the trouble elsewhere keeping their hands full, neither government has control over their side of the border. They depend on militias and PFs, as do the rebels. Government forces, guerrillas, militants, groups of all shapes and sizes hawk whatever resources they can to hire PFs. Conflict brings PFs. PFs expand the war zone, and more conflicts erupt in a continuous chain reaction. <laughs> Sounds like our kind of work. Mother base could grow by leaps and bounds. Hard to believe how many of those bipedal weapons have popped up around Africa. When did that start? No more than six months ago. Didn't really hit me until I came here. They're not supposed to be in use yet. Emmerich says they were still doing the last round of fine-tuning. The doctor has no idea. His research has already hit the black market. Both sides of the Iron Curtain will have it by now. <sighs> Even so, they're spreading much too fast. Sure, the Walker Gears can operate in any terrain. Their mobility's just as good in the jungle as it is in the desert. That would come in handy in a place like Africa. They are modules that can one day be used as nuclear weapon systems. And with that in mind, the numbers are way too large. There must be another reason they're so widespread. Like what? It's all about needs. To small-time outfits like most of these private forces, this product is a dream come true. 
Hell, it goes beyond Piaz. This is the ultimate weapon, the forbidden fruit for anyone with an enemy to fight and people to defend. A nuclear deterrent. Exactly. Sounds familiar, huh? PFs are all operating off your playbook. You created these times. But could this be the new weapon in Africa that Emmerich talked about? If it is, why is Cypher letting everyone and his brother get their hands on one? What comes next? Selling nuclear weapons in the open? Making them public property? Why don't they give that a try? Then the next war really will be fought with sticks. Right. The man we're dealing with isn't foolish enough to make a suicide pact with the world. So, what is Cypher really up to? Zero Risk Security aren't as hardcore a military outfit compared to the other two PFs in this region. The company sends operators to conflict regions around the world, not just Africa. They have decades of combined experience. They're also based out of South Africa. Their headquarters is in Johannesburg. A lot of their work involves corporate security for South African companies, but a good number of their operators are retired South African military. So don't mistake them for a bunch of security guards. Rogue Coyote operates mainly out of Africa these days. Of the three PFs, they're the smallest. However, they scooped up most of the Rhodesian SAS after the country collapsed four years ago. Picture their entire organization as one big special forces unit. With Rhodesia a British colony, the Rhodesian SAS had its origins in 22 SAS C Squadron. They started out as a group known as the Southern Rhodesia Volunteers. Close. But in 51, they were incorporated into 22 SAS as members of the British Commonwealth and deployed to fight guerrillas in the Malayan emergency. Even now, 22 SAS keeps the C Squadron designation empty in recognition of their service. In a way, you could say the SAS almost makes up the core of Rogue Coyote. Later on, they were bolstered by other talent, including former Cellus Scouts and 32 Battalion. These guys are direct descendants of the best special forces in the world. They won't go down without a fight. Don't get careless. Kunganga Mine. A civil war's been going on in that region for the last 20 years. It's being fought by what are now two ethnic groups, the Buta and the Mbele. Originally, you could barely tell them apart. But the reason for the current armed conflict goes back to World War I. After the war, their land was colonized by a European power, and it decided to give local control to the Buta. That split the two groups into rulers and subjects, laying the foundations for an inevitable civil war. The friction between them remained even after they won independence from Europe. The Buta are holding on to power to this day, and the Mbele rebels continue to fight back. The conflict is funded by locally mined gold, rare metals, diamonds. They've used the money from those to arm themselves, buy oil and even hire PFs. The Buta administration owns the mining rights to Kunganga Mine. But most of the laborers are Mbele, who they've taken prisoner. The product they've gouged out of their land is bought up by cheap Western corporations. And the civil war is fueled by the profits. That's how it goes. One country's people is split apart by another country. Then the two groups tear up their own land for money in order to fight each other. Now this civil war started by a foreign power is the norm, and it's sucking up all the country's resources. PFs are just the same. They follow the money, taking war with them wherever they go. That goes for us too. It's an endless river of bloody retaliation, and we're standing downstream. Should we make a stand and staunch the flow? Or wade in amongst the corpses and make a bigger splash than the rest. We'll follow your lead, boss. Boss, about those invalids you saw in that devil's house. Poor bastards. All strapped down to the beds, with those lumps on their chest. The medical staff tell me they were probably a type of cyst. Cyst can get that big. In some cases, yes. But supposing they're a kind of atheroma forming on the surface of the skin, the size is just too big, and the appearance is all wrong. In the end, the medical team were at a loss. Those lumps were like nothing they'd ever seen. The fluid you said you got on your prosthesis when you touched one was burned off in the fighting, and the factory burned down too. None of the tests we did once you were back at the base revealed a pathogen that could have caused them. 
meaning we don't have a single sample to work with. Everything went up in flames. What worries the medical team most is whether it's contagious. Whether there's a chance we could end up like that. And? Mother Base's sanitation control has always been strict. After all, war is great at transporting diseases. For the time being, at least. There's no sign of contagion or any symptoms that could be related. One more thing. About the surgery that had been performed on the people in the Devil's House. Yeah. You said that their throats were cut open. With an acoustic tube pushed inside? Right. The tubes were hooked up to tape recorders playing some kind of audio. Well, we picked up some of that audio through your radio transmissions and recorded it here. The Intel team has been working on analyzing the communications lock. What have they found? There's nothing tying the contents together. We've got a report on three deaths in a car accident on the auto route near Marseille. Protests outside the Libyan embassy in London. A press conference with the former prime minister of Sweden. A four-month-old weather forecast for Balikpapan. And then commercials for appliances, cough syrup, and TV dinners. Assuming they're not all staged, they come off as recordings of your average public broadcasts. Public broadcasts? Just radio and TV signals? Yes. And from all over the world. We're looking into whether they're genuine or not, just to be sure. What else? A speech that sounds like it was recorded out on the street, and people chatting about how this year's tomato crop did. And there's nothing they have in common? We're partway through the cryptanalysis. That includes checking all audio ranges and running it backward and at different speeds. Then there's vocabulary breakdown for political suggestions, ideological common points. But I don't think it's gonna get us anywhere. Where were the recordings made? There's nothing linking them from that angle either. Just like you reported, we've detected virtually every major language there is. French, German, Italian, Spanish, including South American accents. Then there's Russian, Hindi, Arabic, Portuguese, Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese. They're nothing if not thorough. <laughs> well, I don't know if we've got them all covered. Ignoring the ones that have gone extinct, supposedly over 5,000 languages exist today. Besides, English isn't one of the ones we picked up. Really? English? I know. Only 5% of the world's population is a native English speaker. But when you factor in those who've acquired it as a second language, nearly one-third of the people speak it. The world's dominant lingua franca. You gotta figure they had it somewhere among all the languages in that place. No English. Bear in mind we didn't hear everything that was played in that room. We couldn't isolate the more distant sounds due to static and the... Well, the program could have been set to change every day. In a nutshell, for reasons unknown, People in that room with a common medical condition were made to listen to recordings in languages from around the world. It's not clear how the growths on their chests fit into it. It could have been treatment for them, or maybe an experiment of some kind. I'm guessing one person knows. Yeah, Skullface. He was there. The only thing we can say for sure is that he's involved. The White Mamba. Nyokayam Pembe. He's the commander of the kids based out of Wale Yamasa. As you know, contract forces of Africa were stationed at that village. Anti-government forces hired ZRS to bring kids there from around Africa for training. But at some point, the adults with the PF started dropping like flies. This was right after we arrived in Africa. We don't know the cause. The kids ended up on their own. Must have been like fish out of water. Nothing to eat, no way to get back home. All the adults taught them was how to use a gun. Sure, they could shoot targets, but hunt for food? Not likely. They wouldn't have lasted long. Then the White Mamba showed up. He was faster and stronger than them, a better soldier, and he knew how to lead. I guess somebody wished upon a star, because their savior turned up like stardust straight out of the blue. The moment he arrived, the kids had their new commander. That was when they started attacking other villages. Word of the infamous White Mamba spread fast. But it isn't just his combat skills that got people talking. As you can tell from the name, he's the only light-skinned kid in the unit. Not to mention the blonde hair and the blue eyes. Not common in those parts. We have no idea where he came from or what he's experienced. The kid's a huge blank. But I'm sure you'll know him when you see him. One other thing. He's still a kid, so don't kill him. Be careful not to hit him with anything lethal. Not even a flesh wound. 
Our mission objective isn't just suppressing a bunch of militants. This is a DDR operation of the kids in that unit. DDR stands for disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Disarmament is obvious. We take their weapons off their hands. The demobilization part means dismantling their military organization to ensure they can't arm themselves again. To do that, you need to capture the unit's commander and have him order his men to disband. In this case, the commander is the White Mamba. There's nobody above him, so he's all we need to grab. Finally, reintegration. Through education and occupational training, we give them a means to live besides war. A lot of kids born in a war zone don't know any other way to live. So before they find themselves back there, we teach them another skill. I'd like to establish this rehabilitation process at Mother Base. That's why we're bringing those kids back here. It's not so much for their sake. It's for the world that we're trying to create. No other way about it. Those kids are amateurs. Bad for business to have them running around where we're trying to work. Bring them all back if possible. Or as many as you can. We place the White Mamba and the rest of his unit in the staff living quarters. How's that going? It's a disaster, but what else can we do? We've taken away his weapons and banned him from using his nom de guerre. Apparently his real name is Eli. He must feel like we stripped him of his whole identity. We'll let things simmer down. I put a guard on him for now. Still the question is, who is he? Where did he come from, and how has he survived? He's still not talking. No, he won't say a word about himself. But you know, it looks like he speaks English. One of the deck crew called out to him in English, and he said something back. He just lost it all of a sudden, started mouthing off at the guy, in perfect English. He wasn't stringing together words he picked up somewhere. So English is his mother tongue? He could be from the East, or the South, or maybe even further North or South. English is well established in countries all across the continent. It's rooted in Africa like a weed, or maybe parasite is the better word. So just speaking English doesn't help us figure out where he comes from. Could even be from off-continent. Right. In any case, we'll keep an eye on him. If we learn anything else, I'll be sure to let you know. There is going to be a kind of festival held on Mother Base. They are calling it Peace Day. Snake and his men may be without a nation, but they are still an army. And that means sometimes they have to fight the bad guys. Of course, they should not fight at all. It is obvious to me that any problem can be solved with reasonable discussion. Maybe Snake and the others think so too, because the idea is to set aside war for one day a year and relax in peace. I do not know how it came about, but apparently Snake and Miller got the idea while they were talking. And everyone on Mother Base went along with it. To think that deep down they all share a love of peace, that makes me happy. But never mind that. Somehow I have ended up singing on stage. Miller was all, come on, both our names mean peace. It will be great. Why does that mean we have to be in a band? Then he roped Professor Galvez in too, saying, Hey, Galvez comes from peace too. We are the perfect act. I am not sure Miller really understands the origins of the name Galvez. But then again, you always have to take Miller's talk with a grain of salt. What I cannot believe is, he went and told everyone we'd be performing together without even asking my opinion. Now everyone thinks it has all been decided. I like to sing. But I have never had to perform in front of a crowd. I do not think I'm up to this. But everyone seems to be looking forward to it. I guess I would hate to let them down. And anything is better than letting Miller sing. <laughs> oh, that was mean. Miller said he was going to write a song for us. I wonder what it will be like. It is funny. The more nervous I get, the more I find myself looking forward to it.